Yeah, baby, you got the right spot. This is Funny Like a Clown Podcast. I'm your host, Dennis Worth. Uh, episode 148, uh, May. We're in May. Hey, I had to check what month we were in. I don't know. That's how good I know what's going on. May 7th, 2022. And uh, here to talk about a, a comedian, I guess uh, you'd say groundbreaking for his time and you know i've said before and uh funny like clown podcast we're exploring the history of comedy and some of these comedians i know very well some of these comedians i know a little bit about some i don't know anything whatsoever about this is one of the guys well i did know you know he's part of the comedy world i really didn't know much about his career uh i guess i didn't catch his stuff growing up and uh Although I did, you know, I mean, I, I did know he was part of the comedy community. We're going to learn here together, okay? Because he's a British comedian, and, uh, well, he did do a, a lot of work in the United States. Hey, man, I, did, I, didn't, I didn't catch it, but I wish I had now learning more about him. Um, Mr. Eddie Izzard, or Miss Eddie Izzard, or because I guess he prefers Miss instead of uh, uh, Mr. Anyway, we're going to get into that. As always, today's episode is brought to you by G Vegas Buffalo Sauce. For the spicy, sweet, savory taste of game time, put the whammy jam in your mouth. Go to www.gvegas.webs.com. Get it shipped to your door. Go green, go fresh. And second, you bite into that whammy jamma. That's what you're going to say, too. Let's see. Um, as I said, he's a British stand-up comedian. Um, he used uh, rambling and uh, whims of, whim, whim, whimsical mondos. Um uh, called uh, pantomime. It's a style they use in the UK, and uh, became very popular over there in the UK. Uh, did a bunch of comedy tours, and uh, God bless to even have the stamina to do half of what this guy did. I don't even know what to say, but uh, had a comedy tour in 1993, live at the uh, Ambassadors. Uh, 1996, uh, the fine article, uh, 1997, glorious 1998 uh, dress to kill, uh, 2000 circle, 2009 stripped, uh, 2013, uh, force majeure. And, uh, this guy just never stopped touring, man. And like I said, if your body can keep up with that kind of abuse, then God bless you. Cause that's, uh, <laughs> that's, that's, that's a lot of nights on stage, baby. And I'm uh, moving town to town and, and your back starts aching and your bones start aching and, you don't know what town you were in, if it was last night or the next night, or where the heck you're at, and it can be a a lot of uh, a lot of demand on your body to, to to do that much work in comedy. Where do all everybody thinks you're just having fun telling jokes on stage? You don't get what it takes off stage to get to that point. Okay. Uh, started a TV series in uh, 2007, The Riches. Uh, had a film career, uh, included uh, Oceans 12 and 13, Shadow of the Vampire. Uh, the Cat's Meow and Valkyrie, and uh, that was one of Valkyrie with Tom Cruise. That was one of the ones. That was one of the movies I intended on moving, watching, but never got around to. And uh, I may have to go back and back and watch it. Uh, did some uh, voice work. We both said voice work's uh, big in this business. Uh, Five Children and It, uh, The Chronicles of Narnia, uh, Prince Caspian, uh, Bonneville, and uh, is on the uh, Netflix series, Netflix series, Green Eggs and Ham, which every comedian wants to be on Netflix nowadays. So if you get on there, hey, you're pulling something off, baby, right there. Uh, uh, had a Broadway performance, A Day in the Death of Joe Egg. Uh, <laughs> here's one that just cracked me up when I laughed. I usually I don't read something and crack up and take something funny. But this one, I actually, I laughed out loud when I read this one. Uh, 2009, he completed 43 marathons in 51 days for uh, Sports Relief, which is a charity organization, and had uh, no history of wanting, running long distance, you know, to, to his name. It was just, you know, it's for charity. Yeah, fuck it. I'll go run some marathons. <laughs> 43 and remember. I mean, I don't care if you're good at track in high school or something like that, okay? To run 43 marathons in 51 days without have, ever having done it before. I mean, uh, that that's just that's when you know you're in the charity right there i'll do whatever it takes man all right i mean and just to complete them i mean not just to make the attempt to actually complete them that's that's really saying something there uh followed it up running 27 marathons in 27 days in south africa then tribute to the honor of nelson mandela uh he's gen gender fluid which means he don't identify as a man or a woman uh he said he prefers she or her but uh don't mind being called uh he or him so I guess he's not offended, you know, by whatever. It's his life. 
And if you're offended, that's your business, but he's not offended. Him. Call him whatever you want. He's okay by it. Let's see. Uh, studied drama at the University of Sheffield. Uh, toyed with comedy a little bit while attending uh, with friends. He took his act to the streets. And uh, I guess they had some success for it. Uh, I split off from his friend and spent the 80s working as a street performer in the U.S. and Europe, which, uh, yeah, I, I'm from, I go up to Boston, you know, every now and then. And I go down to Faneuil Hall and they got the street performers where, you know, they got their little section of the walkway where they pull you over, try to pull you over and put on a good show. You know, they got to get your attention. And then, they, hey, they put around the hat. Can you throw a dollar or whatever in? And some are better than others. And uh, usually I tip a buck or two. Then there was one guy who was really good. I tipped him five. Well, I gave my son because he liked to give the tip. He's like, that's a five. I'm like, yeah, but he was really good. So there are some better than other street performers. I remember uh, the amazing Jonathan. He stayed out. He started out a street performer. And look what he did. He turned on oh my gut. He had a national act that was, he recently passed away too. But uh, so anyway, after spending the 80s uh, working as a street performer, uh, he developed a comedic voice while talking to the audience during escape acts. So apparently he's performing escape acts on the, uh, right on the street there performing for people. And while he's doing them, he's got to talk to the audience to keep their attention. So you develop your, your street voice, your comedic voice, where you're, you're, you're learning how to roll the words out of your mouth to keep people interested that you don't lose their, their interest. And you learn the art right there. And it's not an easy art to learn. I'll tell you. Uh, after getting his comedic voice, he decided he started doing stand-up comedy in uh, venues in Britain. Um, 1987, he got his first gig at the Comedy Store in London, which I did not know there was a Comedy Store in London. I know there was one out in L.A., but uh, I did know there was another one somewhere else, but I didn't know it was in London. I'm sure that's a patented name, the Comedy Store. Like he can just open up a, a comedy place and call it the Comedy Store because, I mean, you know, you're taking the legendary store's name. It's, it's, it's a patented name. And uh, let's see, uh, after performing there for a while, he opened his own club called Raging Bull in Soho and uh, did that for a while. Uh, then I guess his really big break came in 1991. Uh, he performed his Raised by Wolves Act uh, on TV's Hysteria 3, which is an AIDS benefit. And that got a major, major response when you, you get seen on TV. And I remember... Uh, who was it? Uh, Ralphie May. I watched, he did a comedy class uh, online at the comedy store. And he said, you know, this is my best joke, man. I don't want to put it on TV. I want to say, if I put it on TV, I can't use it in my live act. He's like, well, if you're doing it in a live act, you get maybe two, 300 people listening to it. If you get it on TV, you get tens of thousands of people listening to it. You put your best act on TV, man, because you, you want people to hear it. Okay. You don't save it for the, you know, 50 to 300 people you're playing for daily. You put it on and try to get recognized. So his best skit, he put it on TV, got the recognition he deserved from it. Boom, you're off to the races in comedy right there. Let's see, uh, his 2004 comedy special, Dress to Kill, won the two primetime Emmy Awards. Those are the ones we talked about. So uh, going from getting recognized to getting, you know, Emmy Awards for your freaking comedy specials, there's quite the jump right there. Um, he used to perform shows, I guess, in English and in French, which he spoke the French language too. But uh, in 2014, he got inspired. He started performing in different learning languages just to perform his comedy act in them. He started performing them in German, Spanish, Russian, and Arabic, which he didn't speak, previously speak. So uh, there's some, uh, <laughs> you want to learn some new languages, that's tough enough, but start doing comedy acts in them and actually getting your delivery across. Can you imagine that? Because, you know, I, I asked, you know, a comic that when I interviewed him, I said, uh, you know, have you ever gone to like another country and had to explain a joke because they didn't get the reference? I mean, references are hard enough to get a, get by in your own language. Never mind, to, you know, not just to say the word, but actually get the reference and the deliverance across in another language. That really had to be be something that he pulled off right there. So uh, you always got to challenge yourself in life, man. This guy, he's running marathons, learning new languages, constantly challenging yourself. Keeps it interested. Don't just settle. Let's see. Credit is um, credited Monty Python as uh, his major influence in comedy, and John Kreese, who was like the main guy in Monty Python, uh, said Izzard was uh, the lost Python that he should have been part of that. You know, he had the same type of humor, and and he could have been part of that easily. So I guess Izzy he he carried on the uh, carried on the Monty Python legacy right there. So and became like uh, the fourth Musketeer, or you know, the fourth Stooge, or whatever you want to call it. Um, did some theater, you know, theater work, um, feared, uh, appeared a few times, um, on stage, uh, as a guest of Monty Python. I guess they had a running joke between them where, uh, 
he'd go out on stage with Monty Python. They'd be asked, you know, what were the early days like? And then he'd start talking, which he wasn't with them. He wasn't a part of Monty Python. And they'd escort him off stage and it became a running joke. They just kept doing it and doing it. So uh, still trying to be funny after all that. And uh, let's see, uh, 1999, um, in a play, he did a play. I don't know if it was on Broadway or it was, but he portrayed, portrayed Lenny Bruce, which... Uh, you know, that ain't easy to do. Lenny Bruce, as we talked about in the podcast, man, one of the groundbreaking comics. And I mean, just to, to portray him was something. And, you know, my hero was always Sam Kennison. And I would love to have played Sam Kennison. And I just got to the point I was too old. I couldn't have pulled it off. I mean, not that they would have had me. I'm a local comedian. But even if they would have had me, I was too old to pull off the character. But I said, you know what? For a short film on YouTube, I could pull it off and fulfill my dream of uh, playing Sam Kennison. So, uh, I got together with some of my comedy friends, some acting friends, and uh, we did it, man. We did like a little short 14-minute, uh, like low-budget, kind of raw, street-smart uh, uh, film, short film of me playing Sam Kennison. And to this day, for the budget we had, which wasn't much, it was pennies on a dollar, I, th I thought we put out a really good product. And uh, let's see. Uh, he was part of the BBC miniseries, The Days of Triffids. Uh, the Showtime series, The United States of Terra, and uh, the TV series, Hannibal, and The Lost Symbol. Uh, let's see. Now, I don't know. Hannibal, I almost think that was Hannibal Lecter of the, the what is it, the uh, Silence of the Lambs movies, I think. I'm thinking of the right one there. I think he played a doctor in the series, which was what I read. So, and that was a very popular series. Uh, uh paired on bbc's have i got news for you uh the daily show on comedy central uh, real time with bill maher uh number three on britain's 100 greatest comedians of all time um and you know i gotta say like i said i mean i'm learning about this guy myself well i didn't know who he was i didn't know and i guess he was so much into the political scene over there in britain and and, and europe and the uk and all that stuff where it was tough to learn about this guy because everything we're talking about was kind of confusing because I don't live over there. And it was, I'm not a well-traveled person. I'm not a world traveler. I'm not, you know, not half as smart as this guy probably is, but I mean, certainly uh, he did, he did his share in the political arena. And I, I mean, I'm not able to get into it because I probably explained it in the wrong way and come off looking like a dumb act. Cause it's like a, a blue collar podcast here where I give you a rough idea, of whatever he's doing in comedy and what we as comics can learn from him, what you as the average comedy fan can learn from him. But uh, this guy was very well accomplished in the political arena and rights that he fought for. And, you know, the, the beliefs that he believed in and really trying to make a difference in the world. Uh, uh, got a lot, you know, to prove that he got a lifetime achievement award from Harvard. And I, I got news for you, Harvard University, they don't just hand out lifetime achievement awards to anybody. So this guy is really, really earning it in the, in the, in the, uh, in the world, just trying to make the world a better place to live in. Uh, if you don't believe me, I guess you can check out his book. Uh, believe me, a memoir of love. So, uh, you know, I, I could probably tell you more and more. Um, and you know, this is the next day and age. I was never a gamer, but I mean, uh, you know, a lot of comedians are having this as part of the repertory. He's in some video games too, 101 Dalmatians and Cars too. So when you can get into a video game, that's just the next generation type thing right there. It's a cool thing to have your name. So, hey man, great comedian, great humanitarian. Uh, and damn it, to do that many specials and to run that many marathons for charity, uh, had quite the stamina too. And as I said, give back, man. You know, it's not only uh, it's not only something you should do, it's, it's a responsibility, man. When you're in a position, God's good enough to put you in a position. He's an atheist, I guess. He didn't believe in God, but I do. And, hey, that's, that's people's choices. But uh, either way, you know, it's a responsibility to give back to this planet if you can. So try to make the world a better place. And if you do that, then damn it, you, however you do it. You know, I use comedy to try to promote a child's right to both parents equally the character the child support superhero i do i put out a movie the world needs a new superhero and i use comedy i give back and i'm trying to give kids mom and dad back equally and this guy doing the same thing so make the world a better place go out tomorrow ask yourself tomorrow what can i do i'm gonna wake up in the morning what can i do to make the world a better place and then uh laughter is the best medicine use that to do it good night